Good morning. Uh, I think your prayer lists today are actually in your bulletin. So uh, please take those home with you and, and use those in your prayer time. You will note also on that prayer list that the Midwest Distribution Center is making a special plea for clean, gently used, or new blankets uh, for the people of, I want to say Thailand. Anyway, they need blankets, and if you'll bring them here to the church, we'll make sure that they get up to the Midwest Distribution Center. Um, make sure you sign up to help with the Thanksgiving dinner. The sign-up sheets are downstairs in the fellowship hall. Are there any up here? No, they're all down in the fellowship hall, so make sure you sign up for that. The community Thanksgiving service will be next Sunday at 3.30 at Bothwell Chapel. Um, we will be participating in that. We are leading the music, so make uh, plans to attend on that. Finance and Ed Council meet this afternoon after at 1 for finance, 2 for Ed Council. This will be our last meeting of the year, so make sure you plan on coming to that if you're involved. And now if I could have all veterans to please stand. have given of being away from families, who have served overseas here on our own country, who continue to serve. We thank you for their dedication, for their willingness to serve. We thank you and ask you to bless them, bless all veterans across our great land. Keep those in your protective care that are still serving. Heal those who have been wounded and comfort the families of those who have died. These things we all pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now we will prepare our hearts for worship. <coughs>
please stand and join me in our call to worship. It is time to wake up. It is time to prepare. It is time to get ready. God needs us to proclaim the good news. It is time to start planning. For God's invitation to fulfill our church. It is time to worship. God is here now. Would you please join me in our opening hymn, Glorious Day, and the words will be on the screen. I will be directing them who will be leading you. <laughs> Jesus came. 
We now come to a very special time in the life of the church, a baptism. And I'm going to ask um, all those involved in the baptism if you will come forward. Uh, the parents, the bat baptismally, the sponsors, And once again, the choir is uh, Godparents, along with Brent and Allie and Matthew and Eleanor. It takes a village to raise a child. will be on the screen for you to follow along. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. Who presents this child? Since the earliest of times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil, and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. As parents and sponsors, you are reaffirming these vows for yourself and taking on the responsibility of parents and other sponsors to bring this child up in Christian faith. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, Nick and Jamie, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, putting your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you nurture Harrison in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Now I ask you, the sponsors in the congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection to sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and Harrison in your care? With God's help, we will look for and do the
nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through, through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to free them through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of wounds. He was baptized by John, anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share the baptism of his death and resurrection, and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his work to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness that throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Eric, you there? Spirit, work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It is now our joy to welcome Harrison Dare Rickman. Through baptism, he is incorporated. He is incorporated. You want to see him? You want to see him? Who is he? <laughs> Through baptism, he is incorporated in, by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We all are. We all are one in Jesus Christ. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome Harris as a member of the family of Christ. Members of the household of faith, I commend Harrison to your care and your love. Do all in your power to strengthen him, to increase his faith, confirm his love, and protect him in that love. We give thanks for all that God has already prepared, and we welcome Him to the Christian life. As members together with Him, the body of Christ, and in His congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the Church. By our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and in peace.
um, let's now continue with our tithes and offerings, and then they're going to sing a song kind of around Harrison. Okay. While they get organized. They're taking that photo. They didn't give me candy. I gotta get this out of the way. Just the moving company. No big deal.
We now come to our time of prayer. Um, I have not heard, I've kind of been out of pocket the last couple of days, so I've not heard anything lately on Mary Harris or on Betty Ford. Uh, I did talk to uh, Heather, Betty's daughter, I think it was on Tuesday, and she was doing pretty good. She was doing pretty good. She's still got a ways to go. Um, when I went and saw Mary on Monday, she was still in ICU. Uh, we had gotten a call from her daughter that, uh, needless to say, Doc is going to require some, some help. And Alan has directed uh, the daughter-in-law to a couple of uh, agencies that might be able to help with that. It's probably more than any one of us at the, in the congregation could do. They're going to, he's probably going to need some full-time, someone there full-time. So uh, please keep both of those in your prayer. Uh, Brent's mother had her liver transplant and is doing... Yep, she's in recovery. Uh, everything went well. Um, it went textbook, so yeah, praise so, God. So praise God for a textbook liver transplant. So uh, keep Rhonda in your <coughs> prayers. Um, and then, of course, John and Betty, keep them in your prayers as they continue to pray for, pray for, uh, to pray for them as they prepare to move. I'll get it in a minute. And um, Dave Renfro told me that Roger Baum passed away on Tuesday and that Roger was the one who was responsible for building our altar rail. So keep his family in your prayers uh, this next week. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, what a joy it is to come into your house today and to celebrate the baptism of one of your greatest creations, a baby. We thank you for Harrison and, and for his family, for all of those who stand in support and to help raise Harrison and Charlotte and Nick and Jamie. We also pray for all of our other little ones in this congregation, Lord. We are so thankful to hear the voices of children, to see them learning and loving Jesus. We are thankful for those who work to help them learn about God in Sunday school and through God's Super Saturday. It is truly an honor to be able to have children and to teach them to worship you. Father, we are also thankful just for the day that you have given us, for allowing us to rise from our beds, to awaken, to put our feet on the ground, and although some of us may be moving a little more slowly, we are still moving forward. Help us to look at each new day as a gift, a gift in which we can, one, share the love of God with someone around us, and two, that we can learn something new. Father, we pray for all of those who are not so fortunate as to have family and friends, those who perhaps don't have a church home where they can be taken in and comforted in times of grief and sorrow and sickness. We want to be that family for those. We ask that you bring into our presence those needing to learn about Jesus and grace and love and mercy. Father, we lift up to you all of those on our prayer list. We pray for those who are in the hospital and, and those who are healing. We are thankful for physicians and nurses and medical teams who can perform such wonderful acts as giving new livers and repairing shoulders and setting bones. We pray for healing, for comfort, for all of those who are suffering. We pray especially for those, Lord, in California, once again suffering from the wildfires, those who have lost their lives trying to outrun the fire, those who have given their lives in trying to contain the fire, those who have lost everything to the fire. We can't begin to imagine what that may be like. We offer our prayers for peace for those people, comfort and, and solace. 
Once again, Lord, there has been a shooting in, in a community where many have died. We pray for those families. We pray for the family of the one who caused the incident. The grief and the burdens that they carry are great. As we continue our service, we remember all of those men and women who stood earlier as veterans of our country. We pray for all those who are still serving, whether it be on, on our own country, in our own, on, in our own homeland, or overseas. Be with those men and women, be with their families. Keep them safe and bring them home to their loved ones. We are grateful that we live in a, in a democratic country where we can vote and elect our government. It may not have turned out the way we individually have wanted, but Lord, we know that if those men and women look to you, our country will be led by godly men and women. We thank you for all of your blessings. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of those times that we failed you, and in all things, may we ever keep our eyes focused on the one who gave his life so that we might gain eternal life. We offer this in all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite you to stand as we sing, How Great Thou Art. <coughs>
pray the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So a local priest and a pastor were fishing uh, beside the road one day after a storm. They thoughtfully made a sign that said, the end is near. Turn around and save yourselves now before it is too late. One gentleman, they showed it to the car as they passed by. And one gentleman drove by and he said, leave me alone, you religious nuts. And he drove on. Suddenly, the pastor and the priest heard a big flash. They looked at each other. They said, do you think we maybe just should have put a sign up that said, road out, bridge out ahead? <laughs> that may bring a few laughs. But it seems that many in our religious community are concerned about the end. The end of time, the apocalypse, the rapture, as some call it, the day of the Lord, as it was known in the Jewish tradition. It's simply, whatever you call it, the end of the world as we now know it. Since the beginning of the early Christian church, believers have been waiting for Jesus to return. When he comes back, they believe he will overthrow the forces of evil, he will resurrect the dead, and he will establish God's kingdom. American churches, in particular, seem obsessed with the second coming of Jesus. There are books in this, on the subject that have been either predicting when the end will come or how it will be played out. There have been movies made that speculate about how it's all going to happen and what will happen, when it will happen. Much of the obsession of all this tends to be based on the dramatic end-time writings that Paul wrote in his letters to Thessalonica. But Paul was, was writing to believers, was he writing to believers about the end-time scenario? Was that really his purpose? So I want us to read the passage in Thessalonians that we're talking about. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who do not have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means pre precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be left up, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord, forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks now, as, as we just read that for a first reading, we might be led to think that Paul is indeed writing to the believers about what was going to happen when Jesus returned. But there was more going on in that letter that we should explore before we become too obsessed with Paul's end times writings. Paul was writing this letter to the congregation of the Church of Thessalonica <coughs> in light of two concerns that had been brought to him. The first concern was that believers were suffering afflictions. They were being persecuted because of their faith. And Paul praises them and reminds them to remain steadfast in that faith, to continue to uh, show the example, be an example of the gospel in their lives, even in the midst of all those afflictions and all those persecutions they were having. He reminds them in the letter that even during persecution, they should continue to live a life that is pleasing to God to continue to work together in love 
and in service and to love one another and to be blameless before God until Jesus did return. The second concern that had been raised and that Paul addresses is a little bit more specific. Some of the congregation, some of the members of this church at Thessalonica had died since Paul had been there. And people seemed concerned that those people who had died would not see or share in the blessings of the Lord when he returned. And that's the part of the letter that we have read today. Now, when someone writes a letter, they usually, you usually write it for a specific reason, do you not? For example, at Christmas time, children write letters to who? Santa Claus. And when it's also Christmas time, many families write often a rather lengthy expose on all of the affairs of their family during the last year. Everything that has happened to them, all the exciting news. Now, for someone who does not know that family, reading that letter would probably be of no interest to them. They wouldn't care where they went on vacation or who had been born. They, 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 it just doesn't matter. They don't know these people. And it is to a specific audience that Paul is writing that letter. When he was writing it, he was addressing a specific group of people. He was not writing to us here in 2018. We have much different concerns now, and our situations are totally different than those of that time. However, even though our situations may be different of those than the early church in Thessalonica, most believers, most of us still wonder about when and how Christ will return. There's a constant hum in the world today about the signs, the end time signs that exist. Many have, a, have speculated that the increase in the natural disasters are a sign that the end is near. Others claim that rumors and wars of rumors, as it is written in the scripture, must mean that Jesus will be returning soon. It seems that as Christians we have become so caught up in trying to figure out whenever whatever is going to happen that we have forgotten to be about the work of Christ. We're so afraid of is it the beginning of the end that we're not taking care of the here and the now. The Thessalonians were also having the same difficulty. They were so concerned about what was happening or what would happen or what had happened to their loved ones who had died before Jesus returned, that they began to worry about the faith of those who had died instead of having the concern for those who were yet still living. For them, death had an unquestionable power. It held them in its grip. And hope was alive only as long as they remained alive. When, when someone died, they felt all hope had been, had been lost. So was, was Paul really writing to them about uh, a full-blown uh, explanation as to what was <clears throat> going to happen at the end times? I, I really don't think so. He doesn't really say much about the return of Christ and the believer's identity in this letter. So then what was Paul's point? in writing this. Paul was writing to them as, as a pastor. He was a pastor who wanted to share with them the hope that Christ is both here and now and in the future. He's not trying to correct their theology of thinking, their theology of believing, but he's wanting to look at their behavior. They are grieving as people who had no hope. How many times do we hear the expression, there's no hope, there's just no hope. We even say it when someone is diagnosed with cancer. My friend has cancer, and there's no hope. We live, unfortunately, in a world of hopelessness. We face death every day. We hear it nightly on our news. 
We hear about it in our, in our communities. The gentleman who made this. We even face death personally when we lose beloved members of our own church family. Paul is consoling his readers by reminding them that they have hope, unlike those who do not know God. Paul wants to make sure that as a church they understand they don't have to worry. Whether dead or alive, they will be because the Lord has promised to be with them and because of what God has done in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was trying to remind those who were reading this letter in Thessalonica that God had called them, Christ had loved them, and that the believer who dies in Christ remains in Christ. He borrows imagery that is both biblical and political, things that the people would have understood at the time, like the cry of the command and the archangel's call and the sound of God's trumpet and the meeting of the Lord in the air. These were imageries that he and his people understood at that point in time. But today, hundreds and hundreds of years later, we read them literally and use them and other end time images in, a, in an effort sometimes to scare people into believing in Jesus Christ. You don't want to be left behind. You want to know the Lord so that you will be caught up in the air. That's scaring people into believing in Christ. It's not helping them develop a relationship. Paul was wanting to strengthen their hopes so that they could be encouraging to other people. He also wanted the readers to understand that life in Christ begins in the present world. It begins with us. And that salvation would only fully be realized on that last day. Our salvation is an ongoing living process. All that Paul intended to say was that whether we were dead or alive when Christ returns is that we are with the Lord. Everyone who is dead or alive, if they are believers, are with the Lord. So why is that so hard for us to take in, to believe, to understand? People ask me questions all the time, especially when there's been a death. Does this mean we'll stay in the grave until we return? Or does this mean we go straight to heaven when we take our last breath? My belief, personally, is that I believe when we take our last breath here on earth, our next breath is with the Lord and we are in his presence. There's no waiting for Christ to return. We are in the presence of God. Can I explain the scenario of how that will happen? Nope. Nobody can. If they tell you you can, don't believe them. Does that make all those questions that we have unimportant, though? And the answer to that is also no. But Paul is telling us, don't really worry about how and when and where it's going to happen. As believers, put your hope and your trust in what God has done and what God is doing and what God will continue to do until Jesus does return. We live in this here and now, in-between kind of time. We know what has happened. We know what will come, but we're caught in the middle. Paul was saying in this letter, in that in-between time, we just need to live a life that is blameless before God while we wait for the return of Jesus. We sometimes lose sight of the fact that every moment of the church's life is formed by the expectation of what is about to happen. We should be excited about the second coming of Christ. That's not, that's not a problem. But as believers, we should not be dwelling only on our eternal future, what it will be like in heaven, when we will be in heaven, how we will get to heaven. We should be dwelling on how we can share the hope that there is an eternal life, that 
there is heaven with those around us. We should be sharing the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. We support Lebanon Matthew 25 Ministries, the King's Closet, not because we think, or we are so naive to think that giving a few dollars or a few cans of food or a few of our gently used clothes is really going to save the world. But we do it because we know that by doing that, it is giving someone else hope. We do it in light of knowing that today, God is love, and that tomorrow we should be sharing that love with others. We should be looking forward to sharing that at the end there will be a banquet table far beyond anything we could imagine. And we as believers will be feasting at that table. That's what we should be sharing with others. Even every time we as Christians, speak word of forgiveness in circumstances where there's been bitterness or words of hatred. When we speak words of love, we are speaking into the future tense, meaning they are used now in a present language, but they are also the language of creation that God has given us and the language that we should continue to be using with those around us. The end times are still in the future. Christ is coming back. But what is important is right here and now, today. What are we doing? So what can we take from this scripture? The day of the Lord, the apocalypse, the rapture, what, what does all that mean? A lot of it means all that's been blown way out of proportion. And I think one of the best things that we can learn from Paul's writing is that we should honor the memory of today. We should honor those who are living today. We should honor those who have passed on. But yet we should be focused on sharing and helping others to be also at a point that when they die, they will be able to focus with the Lord. In 1996, uh, Linda Ellis wrote a poem, and if I could get the, the ushers to help me a bit. Uh, she wrote a poem called The Dash. How many of you have heard the poem The Dash? It's become probably one of the most famous funeral poems that are read, and that's way too small, I know it. You're going to get a copy, and Conrad, I will make sure you get a copy big enough that you can read as well. It's now considered to be a proclamation of ardently living a meaningful life. It has become an inspirational reminder that it's not about the number of years that we spend on the earth. It's about the number of years and what we do with the dash. Someone was born in such and such time, dash, they died in such and such time. What happened? in that period of the dash. To live in the dash means to boldly live a life that impassions you while you are positively thinking and impacting your friends and your family, your community, and even strangers. Your dash is not perfect. Nobody's dash will ever be perfect. It's an ongoing journey. It's a journey filled with joy and with intention. And it looks different for everybody. Everybody's dash is going to be different. <clears throat> the dash, in a way, reflects our salvation and the hope we have in Jesus Christ because we believe in what God has done, is doing, and will do. We should live for Christ each and every day while we wait expectantly for the return of Christ, knowing that we are going to spend our eternity with him in the presence of God. To put it another, we must all live as if the apocalypse, the end times, was going to be happening tomorrow. Live your today fully. Live it for God. Every generation since Paul has written that letter to the church 
has had disasters, sickness, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, all the things that go on even still today. The end of the world seemed as imminent to them at that time as it does to us. The believers in the early church were convinced that Christ was going to return in their lifetime. There were signs and speculations of his return. Paul, although he too expected the return in his lifetime, was telling the early church, don't be focused just on that or when it will happen. He says, instead, share the promises of God in the resurrection of Jesus. On the other side of that poem is, a, is another poem that she has written that kind of expounds 